linear optical effects, the good, the bad, and the esoteric. And as I was mentioning, the uh, title comes from a very famous Western movie. It's called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. There are three outstanding actors. Uh, and uh, so uh, what, I, what I've titled my talk is The Good, the Bad, and the Esoteric. Esoteric is a word that corresponds to mysterious properties. So I will show that nonlinear optical effects have uh, some very good, interesting aspects. Uh, which help us to generate new wavelengths from given wavelengths, convert wavelengths of light. It has an impact in the communication systems in terms of crosstalk. The same nonlinear effects can lead to severe crosstalk in signals. And it can lead to generation of light uh, or photons with very uh, counterintuitive properties, uh, essentially what are called an entanglement and squeezing and so on. So my talk essentially will be uh, with the three parts. I'll, I'll initially talk of the good parts, the bad parts, and the esoteric parts. So we are, when we study optics, we normally look at linear optics where the polarization, the electric polarization inside the medium is proportional to the electric field. And the quantity here, chi, is susceptibility. So if when I plot P versus E, I get a straight line essentially implying that if you have a sinusoidal electric field incident on the medium, the polarization generated in the medium is the same sinusoid, the same frequency, and polarization is nothing but dipoles which are oscillating, and these dipoles oscillate and radiate the same frequency omega. So that is the way light propagates through a medium, it gets scattered by the medium and so on and so forth. So normally when you shine any light into a medium, the scattered light or the transmitted light all have the same frequencies. There is no new frequency that is generated in this process. Now, this particular e equation is only valid for small electric fields, which means essentially the electric field is small enough so that the dipoles are in the linear approximation region. When your electric fields increase in magnitude, and that's what happened when lasers were invented, that you can have extremely high electric fields within the medium. In this case, this is only an approximation and we need to worry about higher terms in the expansion. So the electric polarization depends not only on the electric field E, it can also depend on E squared, there is a term in E squared, there's a term E cube and so on. And all these are the nonlinear terms in this relationship. So this comes about uh, essentially something like, uh, as an example, if I take if I take a simple pendulum, for small oscillation, we know that the time period is independent of the amplitude of oscillation. Uh, we got a simple harmonic oscillation, but if you increase the amplitude to say 30 degrees or 45 degrees, the, the motion is no more harmonic. It is periodic, but it's not harmonic. And the uh, time period will depend on the amplitude of oscillation. So, same thing happens when you have very strong electric fields inside a medium. You have to worry about the effects of these terms. This is called the second order effect because it's proportional to E square. This is a third order effect, P proportional to EQ. Uh, this D corresponds to second order susceptibility and chi 3 is the third order susceptibility. So if you plot P versus E, you don't get a straight line, but a curved line. And you can see here, if you have a sinusoidal wave here oscillating as a function of time, the polarization is no more sinusoidal because you have E squared and E cubed terms. So as an example, if I look at the E squared term, and if I incident a light wave of the form A cos omega t minus k omega z, k omega is the propagation constant of the medium, then to substitute this into this equation, you get a polarization nonlinear component as cos squared omega t minus k omega z. And if I expand the cosine square in terms of uh, one plus cos two theta, you see that there is this nonlinear polarization has a DC term, which is independent of time, and a term which depends on cos two omega t. So what this implies is if you shine light into a medium which possesses this nonlinearity, then the light will generate, will, will also induce polarization in the medium, which has a component at two omega. 
Now, as I mentioned, polarization is nothing but oscillating dipoles. So when the dipoles oscillate, they will generate electromagnetic field at two mega frequency. And so we expect that such a medium should be able to produce a new frequency of two mega. So I take a medium, I launch omega. The medium has a nonlinear component of polarization at two omega. And I expect a two omega radiation to come out of the, of the medium. So uh, this is linear optics where you take glass, shine uh, a red laser light, light, for example, it refracts and comes out as red. There's no change of color. But in nonlinear optics, you can shine a red laser into a crystal, which has a frequency omega, and out comes blue, which is the frequency two omega. So the frequency gets doubled and the wavelength gets halved. So this leads to generation of new frequencies. And this is a very, very important effect in um, optics. It is used in um, constructing many lasers today, many lasers that you get, including the green laser pointer that many of you may have seen. It has a nonlinear crystal within the, uh, within the small pointer, which converts, uh, converts infrared to green light. So this is a very important aspect, uh, and this leads to generation of new frequencies. Now, instead of launching one wave, if I were to launch two waves at two different frequencies, omega-1 and omega-2, you can see the nonlinear polarization is proportional to the square of this term. So you'll have a term which is cos omega 1t times cos omega 2t, and that generates new frequencies, omega 1 plus omega 2 and omega 1 minus omega 2. And this is the sum frequency generation. This is difference frequency generation. So when you launch uh, two waves inside the crystal, you can actually generate not only the second harmonics, but also the sum and the difference frequencies. So you can actually generate a very large number of frequencies by just starting from a single frequency wave or uh, two waves at two different frequencies. Now, even if dipoles are oscillating, what is the guarantee that the radiation from individual dipoles will all add in phase? I might have a billion dipoles or 10 to the power 23 dipoles oscillating as a function of time, but what is the condition under which all this dipoles radiation adds up constructively and gives me a, a radiation? And this appears through a condition called phase matching condition. So one can actually write down Maxwell's equations, find out conditions under which this is possible. And what you find is that to be able to generate second harmonic efficiently, you must satisfy a condition that the propagation constant of the medium at frequency two omega must be twice the propagation constant at frequency omega. In terms of refractive indices, this is nothing but saying that the refractive index of the medium at omega must be equal to the refractive index at two omega. Now, this is not possible because all media have dispersion. So if you change the frequency, the refractive index will change. So this condition normally is not possible to achieve, but equations tell me that in order to be able to generate a two omega frequency from omega, I must satisfy this condition called phase matching condition. Now there is an interesting way to understand this condition that is through the picture of photons. A photon is a quantum, quantum of light. So what is happening in second harmonic generation is two photons at frequency omega each having energy h cross omega, merge into a single photon at frequency two omega, having an energy h bar two omega. So energy conservation implies that the frequency of the photon which is coming out after merging of these two photons is twice the frequency of the incident photon. So if you are to put a million photons uh, at omega and convert all of them to two omega, I will have half a million photons of frequency two omega. Energy is conserved. The number of photons is not conserved. The energy, total energy is conserved. Now, classically, we know that whenever this process takes place, I must also conserve momentum. So the momentum of each individual photon is H cross K. And the momentum of the output photon here is H cross K to omega. So momentum conservation implies that the sum of these two momentum must be equal to the momentum of this, which is nothing but the phase matching condition. So, Although I'm using a quantum picture here, I don't need quantum picture to describe this phase matching. It comes from Maxwell's equations. And I can show that in order to efficiently generate the second harmonic from frequency omega, I must 
satisfy phase matching condition. So if you if I calculate how the uh, power or the efficiency of conversion from omega to 2 omega takes place as a function of length of the medium, if I satisfy phase matching, then the efficiency quadratically increases with distance. So it's, it's a quite a rapid increase in efficiency as a function of length. But if I am non-phase matched, that means if I don't satisfy this condition, k2 omega is equal to k omega, what I find is the efficiency is never able to build. It's a system, something like mechanical systems in which you have, if you have two coupled pendulums uh, and if the time periods are equal, you can transfer all energy from one pendulum to the other through the coupling process and back and forth exchange. But if you have non, non uh, uh, if you have two pendulums whose time periods are not equal, you cannot transfer all the power energy from one pendulum to the other pendulum. You can transfer a certain fraction and comes back. And so this is similar thing is happening here that if you don't phase match, the efficiency never builds up. Very low efficiency. In fact, you can show that the efficiency may be 10 to the minus 8%, 10 to the minus 9% or so. Very, very small efficiency. I would say almost negligible. Now, so how do I achieve this phase matching condition? So initial uh, proposals by Bloembergen uh, was, uh, one of them was to use birefringence. That means birefringence is a property of anisotropy in crystals where if you have a uniaxial crystal, you can define two refractive indices, the ordinary refractive index and the extraordinary refractive index. So you can actually choose a situation where one frequency is an ordinary wave, the other frequency is an extraordinary wave, and like this, it is possible to achieve phase matching. And this technique is used uh, extensively in um, nonlinear optics. The problem with this technique is you are restricted restricted the type of crystals. If your crystal is not anisotropic, you can't use this phase matching condition. It also restricts put restrictions run on the wavelengths that you can use and the efficiency of this interaction process. So way back in 1961, when Bloembergen gave his original paper, he also proposed a different technique called quasi-phase matching, where you periodically reverse the sign of the nonlinear coefficient across the length of the crystal. Now, if I take a crystal with a, uh, with a certain uh, orientation, for example, if I take lithium niobate, it's a very uh, interesting crystal. It's a ferroelectric crystal. So its domains are pointing up, down, up, down, periodically. I'm reversing the sign of the nonlinear coefficient periodically. Then what happens is, this periodic modulation in nonlinearity gives me a grating vector, 2 pi by capital lambda. Lambda is the period. And so the difference in k2 omega and 2k omega is compensated by the small vector because of periodicity. So this is called quasi-phase matching. And this technique can be employed for any crystal at any wavelength uh, for any uh, uh, any uh, any of the polarization states and so on. So this is a very very uh, very useful technique. And today there are uh, multiple multiple experiments and many of the devices which use nonlinear optics for high efficiency generation. All of them use quasi phase matching techniques. And so this particular technique, you are compensating for phase mismatch or momentum mismatch by providing a momentum of this. Uh, uh, momentum provided by the spatial variation of the nonlinearity along the length of the interaction. So if I were to show the same plot, a phase-matched interaction, the efficiency keeps going up like this quadratically. A non-phase-matched operation is only partly going up slightly and coming back. Well, a quasi-phase-matched actually is not as good as phase-matching, but it is much better than non-phase-matched, and I can have very high efficiencies in this process. So most experiments today involving nonlinear optics use this quasi-phase matching techniques. And in fact, people now use uh, what is termed as domain engineering. You can generate periodic domains with uh, different uh, different kinds of designs, superstructure gratings, chirp gratings, fanned gratings, multi-period gratings, and so on. So uh, these are called uh, periodically polled gratings. And these gratings design can be analyzed. And what is essentially important is the Fourier Fourier spectra 
of these gratings which are responsible for the interaction processes. So here is an example uh, way back in 2006 when they had a crystal with multiple periods here, as you can see here. So by launching a 1.06 micron wavelength here, you generate all three primary colors some through second harmonic generation, one through third, third harmonic generation, one through some frequency generation. So multiple processes are possible in a crystal and you can generate all three primary colors. Effectively, you can have a white light, a white light laser or white light display by starting with a single laser and use domain engineering to achieve this process, all three primary colors. Now, the question that arises first is, uh, if I can convert red to blue, which means uh, omega frequency to two omega frequency, the obvious question that I, uh, that I get to know is whether can I generate omega from two omega, the reverse process. And uh, one can show classically that this is a classically impossible process. Maxwell's equations tell me that omega, two omega cannot generate omega. Omega can generate two omega, but two omega cannot generate omega. And this is purely a quantum mechanical effect, uh, exactly like spontaneous emission. Spontaneous emission is a quantum mechanical process. To explain spontaneous emission, I must quantize it. I must, I must use quantum mechanics. Similarly, for this process of two omega to omega conversion, which is called down conversion, I must use quantum process. But I can use this as a amplifier which means if I launch a strong wave at two omega and a weak wave at omega, one can show from those equations, Maxwell's equations, that this particular crystal can amplify red, provided the red light comes at a certain phase. So it's called a phase sensitive amplifier. It's un unlike the conventional amplifiers like erbium dwarf fiber amplifiers or laser amplifiers, which do not depend on the phase of the input light. This particular amplifier depends on the phase. And parametric amplifiers have a long history. Way back in 1831, Michael Faraday observed uh, on a wine glass, if you rotate uh, your finger on the glass, you can actually make the wine vibrate. And uh, this is a parametric oscillator. Uh, some of you may have done this Meldes experiment in college, which, uh, which is a string which you make vibrating by connecting it to a tuning fork. Uh, Lord Rayleigh analyzed this in 1883, and the classic example of this is a child on a swing. So if you, when a child actually uh, is on a swing, what does a child do? It sits and stands, and then sits and stands. So what the child is doing is, in the first quarter cycle, when the child is coming from the top to the, uh, to the equilibrium position, the child is sitting, then, when it goes up, a child stands. So the child completes one cycle of sitting and standing in half a cycle of the swing, and then again sits and stands in the next half cycle of the swing. So what the child is doing is pumping the string by pumping the swing at frequency two omega, where omega is the time uh, frequency of the swing, by and amplifying omega. So you are amplifying the swing at frequency omega by sitting and standing at frequency two omega. Now, two things. Suppose there is nobody to push this, the child on the swing, and the swing is vertical. What the child can do is to shake the swing and pick up sitting and standing with the right face. So if the child sits and stands properly, it, it doesn't have to learn parametric op, op, uh, oscillators. The child uh, automatically can learn to vibrate the swing a little bit and sit and stand at appropriate times and start the swing into motion. And if the child wants to reduce the amplitude of the swing, all that it has to do is to sit and stand at the wrong times. So when it comes down, the child can stand. When it goes up, the child sits, and the amplitude will decrease. So it's a classic example of an amplifier, which is a parametric amplifier, and which is phase sensitive. So this optical amplifiers, which are based on this nonlinear effect, are exactly having the same property of phase sensitivity. And the interesting features about the space sensitive amplifiers are you can show through quantum mechanical arguments that these amplifiers have much less noise figure compared to a conventional amplifier. So conventionally in today's communication system, people use uh, Erbium dot fiber amplifiers, EDFA, and uh, 
Uh, if we can replace the ZDFAs by parametric amplifiers, people have shown through experiments that you can actually extend the reach from 800 to 4,500 kilometers. That's a tremendous increase of a factor of four to five by replacing these EDFAs by parametric amplifiers because the noise added by these parametric amplifiers is much less than the noise added by an EDFA. So this is some of the very important aspects of just the uh, second order effect that we have discussed to generate new frequencies where you don't normally have lasers. You can actually use this for amplification process. And uh, at, uh, when I was in IIT, one of, some of, one of my PhD students did some work on uh, using waveguides, optical waveguides for generating parametric amplification over a large bandwidth. This is uh, recently published some time back. So you have uh, large bandwidth amplification. You can also make processes in which you have multiple processes say, taking place simultaneously, second harmonic generation and some frequency generation and so on. So we have been quite interested in these applications but primarily in waveguides rather than in bulk. Now that is the good aspects of these uh, nonlinear effects. Now let me come to the bad aspects. Uh, so all this is based on uh, uh, optical fibers. Today's internet is essentially, we are able to today listen to this talk and communicate with each other because of the presence of the, uh, the extens extremely high bandwidth backbone, which is there. So this communication is taking place through an optical fiber, which is typically 125 micron diameter. And there's a core inside. I'm sure all of you have, must have learned the optical, the light propagates through this by total internal reflection. So it's all made of silica, which is uh, one of the most abundant materials on the earth. And uh, what is principally done is in a communication link, you can use multiple wavelengths to communicate through the same optical fiber. You have a single optical fiber going from one end to the other end, and you have multiple wavelengths. Each wavelength is carrying its own communication signal, and they're all propagating together in an optical fiber. So you might have something like uh, uh, 40 to 80 different wavelengths present simultaneously in the same fiber. To increase the capacity, you can have multiple wavelengths. Now this poses a problem. And what is the problem? If you put in too much light into an optical fiber, the electric field inside the optical fiber increases to such a value that nonlinear effects become very important. So suppose I take 100 milliwatts of light into an optical fiber. The area of the core is about 50 micrometers square. The intensity of light inside is 2 billion watts per square meter. At this intensity level, the electric fields are very high and this leads to nonlinear effects. Now, the uh, optical fiber does not possess a second order effect because um, uh, only media which do not possess a center of inversion symmetry exhibit second order effects. But the third order effect is present in optical fibers. And this third order effects leads to uh, some effects which I'm just naming here, cell phase modulation, cross phase modulation, four wave mixing, Stimulated Raman scattering and stimulated Bruno scattering. All these are coming from the third order effects, which are sitting in the video. But I will just discuss one of them, which is uh, important for our discussion here. So this particular term, which we had used for generating blue out of red and for parametric amplifier does not exist in optical fibers because optical fibers are amorphous media. There is no crystallinity in it. And there is, so the first nonlinear effect is present is this one. And this one is present in all media, liquid, gases, solids, everything has this effect, third order effects, E cube. So let me see what happens because of this term. So in an optical fiber, you have the polarization consists of a linear term and a cubic term. So let me assume that I have, so these are three of the frequencies which I'm launching in optical fiber, omega one, omega two, and omega three three different frequencies, three different propagation constants propagating through the medium, through the fiber. Now, if you substitute this sum of these three into E cube, you see you have A plus B plus C whole cube. So you have terms like A cube, B cube, C cube, A square, B, A B square, B square, C, C, B, C square, et cetera, all kinds of terms. And you will generate a lot of frequencies, omega one plus omega two plus omega three, omega one plus omega two minus omega three, omega one minus omega two plus omega three, all kinds of combination will come up. And these are all new frequencies. 
That means the fiber has inside a polarization oscillating at all these frequencies. Now, just like we discussed before, whether these frequencies will actually come out as electromagnetic waves or not depends on phase matching. The same phase matching issue will come up here that if you have phase matching, then you will be able to generate all these frequencies. In general, phase matching is very difficult to achieve. So usually you don't expect these new frequencies to come out of the, of the medium at all. Now, so this, uh, this is essentially leading to all this self phase modulation, cross phase modulation, four way mixing. This is all contained in this, this terms. So it's called four way mixing because three frequencies add up or combine to form a fourth frequency. It's called four different frequencies are present, and so it's called four way mixing. So I'm only looking at four-way mixing, which is the major issue here, uh, which is which causes problems in my communication system. So if you had three different wavelengths or frequencies into the fiber, you will generate a fourth frequency, for example, this one. I see these frequency differences are very small. Uh, the frequency difference uh, is such that this fourth frequency, so nu1 plus nu2 minus nu3, is almost close to nu1 and nu2 because this difference is very small. So this fourth frequency is also very, very close to these frequencies. And what it means is if you have three frequencies coming in, you will generate a fourth frequency. So suppose somebody wants to communicate with the same optical fiber with the fourth frequency here, that frequency light out will depend on what the other three frequencies have. And that leads to crosstalk. So if you launch these three frequencies, if it will generate new frequencies and any communication that is taking place at the fourth frequency will be having crosstalk. In fact, the fourth frequency can also mix with these frequencies and create complete chaos in the system. Now, as I mentioned, I must have phase matching. So where does phase matching come in? Now, before that, I would just like to mention that if you send an optical pulse, you see optical communication takes place in the form of digital stream. So you are essentially sending ones and zeros to the optical fiber. Every one corresponds to an optical pulse. A zero means no pulse. So this pulse of light has multiple frequencies. And because this fiber has dispersion, that means the refractive index of glass depends on wavelength. Different wavelengths travel at different speeds. So if you launch all these wavelengths simultaneously into the glass fiber, they will come out at different times because the velocity or the speed of light in the glass depends on wavelength. It's the same phenomena that leads to dispersion through a prism or the formation of rainbows, the same effect that leads to a, a spreading of the pulse because you have launched all these wavelengths simultaneously, but some wavelengths come earlier and some wavelengths come later and so the pulse gets broader. So here's a picture. So I've launched three wavelengths simultaneously into the optical fiber, three pulses, and they're all coming out separately. So you can see that if I launch maybe 100 picosecond pulse here, it might come out as a one nanosecond or 1,000 picosecond pulse. So it gets broadened, and this leads to a problem in communication because this leads to uh, a, an interference between adjacent pulses and so loss of information in my system. Now, it so happens that this uh, dispersion how much of broadening is taking place is controlled by this term. Second derivative of refractive index of wavelength. N effective is the refractive index of the, uh, of the fiber as seen by the pulse propagating. So it depends on this second differential. Now, fortuitously, it so happens that in fibers made of silica, silica glass, this term is zero around the wavelength region from 1300 to this range of wavelengths. And this range of wavelengths is also the region of wavelengths where silica fibers have the lowest loss. So it is just fortuitous that the lowest loss region of fibers and the uh, what is at zero dispersion of the fibers are, is around the same wavelength region. And so uh, this is why the communication system, optical fiber communication systems are all using 1,550 nanometer, 1,300 nanometer, et cetera. This wavelength region is primarily because of low loss and low dispersion. Now, 
I want this dispersion to disappear because I want the input pulses to not to be dispersed, not to become broadened. They want to, I want them to maintain the same size. So I would like to operate at a region where this is zero. Now it so happens, so I can actually control my dispersion by using different fibers. So now it so happens that when this is zero, I also satisfy phase matching condition for four wheel mixing. I know I'm not doing the mathematics here, but it so happens that whenever this term is zero, the frequencies which are actually trying to mix, they satisfy phase matching. So the phase matching means maximum efficiency of four wheel mixing. So you see, you have a problem. You want zero dispersion to achieve increased bandwidth. But if you operate at zero dispersion, you have maximizing the four mixing problem. So what you need to do is you have to use what are called as non-zero dispersion shifted fibers. So here are some very old figures from here. So you see here, four different wavelengths have been, uh, have been launched into an optical fiber, 25 kilometers long. And you see this new frequency is getting generated after 25 kilometers. This is around zero dispersion. So new, many new frequencies have come up, all kinds of combinations of these four frequencies. And if you operate with a finite dispersion, that means here d square n by d lambda square is zero, here it is not zero. And you see hardly any new frequencies getting generated because you are not satisfying this magic. So the four-way mixing problem actually is now limiting what kind of wavelengths you can use for multi-wavelength transmission. And this actually, this nonlinear effects finally are the ultimate limit to the information capacity of an optical fiber. So this ultimate capacity is determined by nonlinear effects. And all these have been taken into account in today's communication system, but we are still limited. Of course, the question is, what is the maximum bandwidth I can achieve using optical fibers? And that's limited by nonlinear effects. So let me come to the last part of my talk, which is the esoteric part. So uh, see, normally when we talk of electromagnetic waves, we talk of the classical picture of electromagnetic waves. The electric field is represented by a sine and cosine terms. So you have uh, uh, this electric field can, uh, this electromagnetic wave at omega frequency can have any energy. But this picture, cannot explain many phenomena that we observe, including spontaneous emission, including the generation of omega from two omega and so on. And we need a quantum formalism which can explain all this. So one can show by what is called as the quantization of the radiation field. I must quantize the Maxwell's equations and I get the uh, modes. That means if I consider a frequency omega of electromagnetic wave, I can show that the energy of that wave can only be in terms of n plus half h plus omega. This is exactly like a harmonic oscillator in classic in quantum mechanics. A quantization of harmonic oscillator gives me the same. In fact, the electromagnetic field behaves like a harmonic oscillator. So this implies that the energy of an electromagnetic field at frequency omega can only increase or decrease in packets of h plus omega. N can be as an integer. So you can only increase or decrease by H cross omega. And this H cross omega packet is called the photon. So photon is just a quantum of excitation of the electromagnetic field. Now to imagine a photon as a particle is a very, very uh, wrong concept. Photon can be a localized, can be delocalized, can be, can be a spherical wave, can be a plane wave, can be anything. So it is just a quantum of excitation of the electromagnetic field. It depends on how you have quantized the field that gives you the picture of quantum state. So, but what is important is I can only increase or decrease the energy of the electromagnetic field in packets of H cross omega. And by quantization, what we find is there is an extremely large range of states of light, single mode states, multi-mode states, single photon states, superposition states, squeeze states, entangled states. W states and many still unexplored states of light. There are still states of light which are still unexplored and people are still working and getting some very interesting states of light which uh, should have applications. 
So I am going to look at this particular state of light called entangled state. So here is a, an experiment which I'm trying to do, for example. So I have a crystal in which I have done some domain inversion in a particular pattern. Uh, now, it so happens that this uh, conversion from uh, 2 omega to omega actually depends on the polarization state. So without going into too much detail, let me say that I send a single photon which is horizontally polarized and has a frequency which is represented by blue here, high frequency. So it's, it can split into two, to two photons. That is, a two omega photon splits into two omega photons. Two different photons of two different frequencies or same frequency. So I have a photon coming in and splitting into two photons. Now there are two possibilities. So it splits into green and a red photon. So in one case, the green photon is horizontal polarized and the red photon is vertically polarized. The other situation is the green photon is vertically polarized and the red photon is horizontally polarized. So when I send a photon here, classically I will say that this photon is either splitting into green horizontal and red vertical or into green vertical and red horizontal. That's a classical picture. But when I do a quantum picture, I find that it actually splits one photon, splits into these two photons whose polarizations are not defined. Feynman uh, has shown that if you have multiple paths from a, 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 a beginning to an end point, if you have multiple paths of transmission, then the total here is that it's as if the system has gone through all paths simultaneously. So it so happens that this photon can split into either this or this. In fact, it is a very more complex state of light which is coming out and these two photons are said to be entangled in polarization. Now, now let me try to show you an experiment to try to, uh, to understand this picture of entanglement. So here is my source which is sending out entangled photon pairs, green and red. And I have a beam splitter here which splits the two wavelengths. The green wavelength is reflected and the red wavelength is passed through. So one photon is coming here, another photon is going here. Now what I do is I put polarizers aligned at 45 degrees, plus 45 here and minus 45. Now, if you have a vertically polarized photon pass, uh, hitting a polarizer which is at oriented at 45 degrees, the probability that the photon passes through is half. It's exactly like Malice's, Malice's law in, in polarization optics. So the green photon when it comes here, sometimes it passes through, sometimes it's stopped by the polarizer. You will not get half a photon coming out. You, either the photon will go through or does not go through. So when the photon goes through, I call it one. And when the photon does not go through, I, go, I call it zero. So I send one, one by one photons are coming. I generate a sequence of bits. And so photon has passed through, passed through, did not pass through, sorry, sorry, passed through, did not pass through, and so on. Same thing the red photon also does. It passes through sometimes, and it does not pass through sometimes. But the funny thing is, Whenever the green photon passes, the red photon also passes. Whenever the green photon does not pass, the zero here, the red photon also does not pass. It's as if before I pass this through the analyzers, the polarization state of the photon is completely undefined. The moment I do a measurement on any one of these two photons, the second photon seems to get immediately into a particular state. So instead of plus 45, minus 45, let me choose 60 and 150. Please remember the difference is 90 degrees. These two polarizers are orthogonal to each other. Same set of, same correlation. There's complete correlation between this digits and this digits. I choose 120 and 30. Again, imagine you have uh, two sets of uh, coins and uh, you have one set of 10 coins, I have another set of 10 coins and I, I, and I flip these coins one by one and I get heads and tails. You also flip your coins heads and tails. Now, your heads and tails have nothing to do with my heads and tails. Sometimes we both get heads, sometimes I get a head, you get a tail, etc. But this is different. Whenever green photon passes through, the red photon has no choice but to pass through. Whenever the green photon does not pass through, the red photon has no choice but to not pass through. And this is, uh, this is a phenomenon called entanglement. And no matter how far they are, 
this seems to be an instantaneous effect. So in quantum physics, essentially, there is no distance coming in the picture at all, the state that is coming out. So it's, it's as if this is one state, and this entanglement is a very, very counterintuitive uh, phenomenon, and that has stood a uh, large number of applications. So measurement of state of polarization of each photon yields completely random results. The two measurements are completely correlated, no matter what orthogonal pair of orientations I choose. Measuring the polarization state of one of the photons immediately defines the state of polarization of the entangled photon irrespective of their physical separation. But you can show that I'm not breaking relativity. I cannot do instantaneous communication with this. But there is something which is happening which is beyond the understanding of uh, classical physics. So this particular aspect of quantum entanglement, which is the esoteric part of nonlinear optics, Please remember, this is all coming through nonlinear optics. This, this one photon splitting into a pair of photons. So one high frequency photon splitting into a pair of low frequency photons is nonlinear effects. And this quantum entanglement is today being uh, used in quantum computation, quantum cryptography, teleportation, a lot of work in quantum sensors, quantum radars, and so on. So it is a very, very interesting field uh, of information science and technology today. Uh, a couple of years back, China launched a satellite, Micius, uh, 500 kilometers from the Earth. And it is actually sending entangled photon pairs, one to China and one to Vienna and Austria. And they are testing all these uh, entanglement schemes, et cetera, for finally making the internet into a quantum internet, which will be completely secure. You can show that uh, communication using these quantum states of light are completely secure against any eavesdropping and by the laws of physics. So the entire world is right now into this business of quantum information. So Europe has a $1.1 billion program. USA has major programs, China and India. Uh, last financial, uh, the, the budget had 8,000 crore rupees announced in the budget to support quantum technologies. So there's a huge push in India to start uh, to, to, to get into this quantum technology effects. And some of this will use nonlinear optics, of course. So I'd like to summarize here to say that nonlinear optics leads to new frequencies. Now, these new frequencies uh, have very interesting aspects. You can have, uh, you can generate new wavelengths which are not accessible normally. You can make quantum parametric amplifiers and so on, very interesting. But it also leads to crosstalk in optical communication. So the multiple channels that are propagating through an optical fiber can talk to each other and because of non linear effects and that leads to problems. And it has an esoteric, mysterious aspects with uh, states of light which have no classical analogs. In fact, uh, one of the applications of these uh, states of light, which is called the squeeze state, has application in gravitational wave detection. Um, and uh, the next uh, next range of this uh, detection using this uh, gravitational wave detectors will most probably use squeeze light for uh, detection. So nonlinear optics is expected to play a significant role in future quantum information science. Uh, thank you very much for your patience.